Good morning. It is good to see everybody who's not about with us this morning. Uh, there are those who desperately need our, need our prayers, and let's keep, we'll make sure we're praying for these, these individuals often. When we start thinking about this morning's lesson in Plenty Word, I remind you uh, about a story that Brother James Meadows told us a long time ago. Uh, James Meadows had, was going to a gospel meeting at one point in time, and there was a lady. There was a lady that met him at the back door. See, that's still what happens. You know, now it's a little different. Now I can kind of meet, you know, by the carport and we can kind of speak and as we pass by. But you can remember when that long ago that we would meet at the back door and we'd shake everybody out and, you know, tell everybody about all those. And there's this lady that met him at the door and on the way out, she said, Preacher, she said, the words that you spoke are not in my Bible. She said, I, he said, I assure you, they are there. She said, not in my Bible. Not in my Bible, I cannot find them. Well, he said, well, I'll tell you what. This will be at the church building 30 minutes early. And if you will come, we can open up the, the scriptures and, and I, I can show you where they are. And indeed, when they, she came early, and she came that 30 minutes early, they sat down to look for these words in the Bible. And she literally had cut them out. They were not in her Bible because she removed them. From the pages of scripture. So when we start thinking about this morning's lesson, this implanted word, what I want us to think about is this idea that there are times we hear God's word and instead of letting it take hold and root in our life, we cut it out. We act like we never heard it. And we go and live life on our own terms, claiming that that wasn't the word of God. See, James just finishes in James chapter 1 talking about sin. In fact, we have a part in our sin, a big part in our sin. In fact, if we look in verse 14 of James 1, he says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and times. See, it's something we desire. It's not sin. We, we talk about it and we talk about the evilness of it and the separation of God and all these things that go with it. We, we sit back and say, well, nobody would ever, ever want to engage in that activity. Because it does so much damage. It separates us from God. It separates us from each other. And, and so it is so bad. It's terrible. But yet we're tempted and we're drawn away by what? Our own desires. And as it goes further from, from here, verse 15, he says, Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Don't be tricked. Don't fall for this. Notice, every good and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down to the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And when we start thinking about God's Word, where did He originate from? Now, I know there are there's human authors that as God spoke, they wrote down exactly what God told them to write down. But it originated in the very mind and the very thoughts of God. And when we read Isaiah 55, we realize that the words that he gave us will do what it is intended to do. It will not return to God fully. And so it's important for us to, to look at that idea for a second. It's something about this word as we read it. There's some things we need to be doing with it. See, I guarantee I can start mentioning some books or some authors. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh yeah, I know all about this. Like if I mention Shakespeare, you may already have a play in your mind, and maybe even characters from that play. It could be Romeo and Juliet. It could be Midsummer Night's Dream. And it could be Hamlet. It could be all, lots of things that we already know. Boom. And we know their personalities, and we know their characters, and we know their analysis. And we can do this for any number of authors. Poets. And we're like, oh, I know all about this. And we may get super excited. And yet, name me the 12 apostles. Tell me some things about these individuals. And all of a sudden, we're like, ooh. But we know Thomas doubted, was he the only one? No, he wasn't the only one that doubted. He's the only one that was professed so much at one point in time, according to John. But when you read Mark's account, they all doubted the women. And so you're like, wow. How about Peter? What can you tell me about Peter? 
He speaks first and thinks second. You can notice that about Peter. He's ready to say something. There's no quiet time when Peter is around. And so when we start looking at these things in the lives of those individuals, there's something about them. Not only do they have characteristics, not only do the, the stories of Scripture or the encounters in Scripture that we come across, not only do they mean something to us, they give us examples. Examples of how we should be and how we should not be. In fact, today I was, I was quizzed, and I didn't know the answer to it. I thought, man, I don't know everything. I can say I don't know. It's okay. And the quiz was, who had the first offering plate? Now, there's a guy who knows the answer to it. But that's something to think about. The offering, a collection box. Who's the first one to do that? In Scripture. And so you look at these like, wow, there's, there's wonderful things that are here. But they're not just here to be here. And that's the thing we have to really take note of. The, the accounts in Scripture are not here just to be here. They give us meaning and reason and example. That's the reason the Hebrews writer could say that, that these words, the word of God is, is sharper than any two-edged sword, able to discern between soul and spirit. That when you start looking at these ideas, God's word is very powerful if we take it as such. And so the encouragement I want to, to look at is what James starts talking about in verse 21. Now, when we go here, notice he says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness, and overflow with wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. So notice he says, lay some things aside. Lay the filthy behaviors aside. Put these away from you. And notice he says, the overflow of wickedness, the abundance of wickedness in our lives. Lay that aside. Because after all, where does sin originate? Where does the temptation come? It comes from the desires of our hearts. There's something within us that wants to do whatever this is. Whatever that act is. And notice it starts there. We go further down, starting in verse 19. Um, two verses up from where we just read. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now notice that. Lay aside that stuff. Now notice wrath. Lay it down, lay down this being upset, blowing her talk, a desire to hurt people. You lay that stuff aside. But be swift to hear. Listen to what it says. Be slow to speak. See, we live in a society, the reason we can't communicate is because we don't understand this principle. That when somebody is speaking, we are to be listening. When God is speaking, we definitely need to be listening. Listening. And so it's important for us to understand that. How can we learn how to lay aside wickedness and sin and filthiness? How can we lay that aside if when God's word is spoken, we don't hear it? Now pay attention to it. And see, notice how it goes further in verse 21. He says, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. The implanted word. In King James, it's in grafted word. In both of these instances, it, it's important for us to take note that when James is writing about the word taking root in our lives, it means you can tell it's there. And when Paul, Paul would talk about this way in Philippians in chapter 1, he said, let your walk be worthy of the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God. And, and the idea with that, not that we're so good because of it, but it's that we live our lives acting like we understand what God's word says. And there are sadly, there are times, and I've met people, you've met people, that they'll come to church on Sunday and they'll praise God, but you can't tell it any other time of the week. See, that's not letting the word of God dwell in you richly as Paul wrote to the Corinthians in Colossians, right? Colossians 3.16. In our singing, let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. We can't let it dwell in us if we're hearing the word and live in a different way outside of the church service. See, it can't work that way. 
The idea of meekness is that we're so wrapped up in something. The only thing that matters is for that to be accomplished. And when we start thinking about this, the Word of God in our lives is what we should be meek about. Honoring God in our lives is what we should be meek, meek about. That for to live our lives in such a way that God is honored and glorified by our lives. But notice how that works. It works when the Word of God is implanted in our heart and takes root. See, when you start looking at things, the Hebrews right here. In Hebrews in chapter 9 describes, uh, describes um, God's new covenant. See, God told Jeremiah in chapter uh, Jeremiah 31 and 31, there was going to be a new covenant. It's not going to be like the one of the house of Israel. It's going to be a different type of covenant. And in this discussion in Hebrews 9, or in Hebrews 8 rather, in Hebrews 8, he describes some things about this covenant that we're, it would do well for us to, to understand, really take note of. Notice in verse 10, for this covenant that I will make, with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. See, in the Old Covenant, under the Old Testament, Moses was given tablets of stone that had the Ten Commandments. When you start thinking about the Old Law, it's just written in a book that was given out by the priests. And as long as they didn't commit certain sins, they were going to be okay. They were when we find out they committed those sins, then they can offer sacrifices. But as the Hebrew writer goes on to describe in chapter 10, that those sacrifices didn't make a person perfect or complete. They had to be offered continually. And so what God says he's going to do, he's going to do something different. He's going to give them the, the law that's going to be in our heart and in their mind. And notice they're going to be God's people, and God will be their God. Why? Because they're living this life that God desires for them to live. It's not something that's in black, white, and red on a piece of paper. This is something that is living in the hearts of individuals. Notice, verse 11, None of them shall, shall teach their neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Now what does that mean? See, under the old law, they were born into a covenant. They were born as God's people, and yet they knew nothing about God. Absolutely nothing. They were born into it. But the only way we can come into the new covenant is that we have to believe the words that God says and obey the gospel. That's the only way. And so whenever we become a Christian, we don't say, well, I need to tell you about who God is. Because you already know. I need to tell you who Jesus is. You should already know. In fact, in Acts 18, when Paul ran across the individuals from Ephesus and they did not know about the Holy Spirit, what did he do? He taught them and he baptized them again because they didn't know who the Holy Spirit was. So when we start looking at this new covenant, you don't just accidentally end up in it. You end it by obedience to God's Word. You understand what God's Word says. So this isn't about a second coming and setting up the kingdom. That's not it. If the kingdom is here and we live by the words that were spoken, so much that they're in our minds and in our hearts. And notice again, he says um, in verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. So as the as sins and transgression of God's law, when we're not what we're supposed to be, when we act against what God's law says, or we don't do what God desires for us to do, He will forget all those things. Why? Because Jesus paid the ultimate penalty. He gave His life, a sinless life, so that we could have forgiveness of sins. And notice in verse 13, in that He says, A new covenant. He has made the first one obsolete. The first one is obsolete. It's not void. Now, what is becoming obsolete is drawn up and is ready to vanish away. But all that is built on what? On what God's word says. And it's important for us to see that. See, when we go back and start thinking about allowing God's word to, 
to implant itself, or be implanted in our hearts and minds and to dwell on it and to live on it. My mind goes back to the parable of the sower. It's a very popular parable. It's something that we need to, to really take note of. Because when we look at that, Jesus pretty, pretty simply, simply just says, the sower goes forth to sow, and some seeds fell by the wayside, and birds came in and ate them, and some fell among the rocky soil, and sprang up real quick because they had no depth of earth. They, the, the sun scorched them and withered away. Some fell among the thorns that grew up and choked them. Some fell on good soil, and it yielded fruit 40, 60, and 100 fold. Wow. Think about this one. One quarter of those, if you want to look statistically, according to Jesus' interpretation of his own parable, one quarter of those, Satan came and snatched the word of God away before it could take root. Some of those will not go home because they wouldn't grant any God's word. But by the way, son, there are some of those in a life like trouble, the troubles and cares of this life, the thorns, grew up, choked out the word. But the good ground, the good ground allowed God's word to flourish, allowed God's word to implant itself. And produce the fruit. See, when we start thinking about this implanted word, we got to really focus on what it says and what it means. And what it means not just for everybody else, but what it means for our lives. See, it's really easy for us to say that as I read this, that you need to fix something, right? And you've got great old, and you start reading that, oh, somebody needs to hear that. I need to write this down and, and give them this prescription, and, and they will handle that. It's hard to sit back and say, oh, this is what I need right now. And say, I need to fix that. And I'm going to tell you some really hard things. There's some things in the Bible, I, there are times I wish wasn't there. Like, love your neighbor as yourself. Or do good to those who spotfully use you. Because there are times when I get frustrated, it's like everybody else. And I don't want to be nice to those people. But at this time, I've got to remember, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I was bought with the price. I can't act like that. And so we've got to understand that. See, when we go back to James 1, he goes further. He says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, tricking yourselves, falling into the same trap yourself. See, after we read other words, these great works, the Iliad, the Odyssey, you can read all any numbers of books. Those are words on a page. Those are words that we enjoy. Those are words that, those are books, and those are, you know, there's Longfellow's poetry, there's all kinds of things that give, that help shine, shine light onto the society and how we live and just give truths out. But those books are, those don't give us life. Those books don't, Give us eternal life. They don't teach us uh, about the things of God unless you're particularly talking about the Word of God. Well, nowhere are we required to do those things. Nowhere are we asked to do those things. But God's Word is to be done. God's Word is to be engaged. God's Word is to be implanted and lived out in our lives. Day after day after day after day, when we feel like it, when we don't feel like it, when life is going great, when life is really hard, when we score the winning touchdown and we miss the free throw. We're every single day of our lives, we're to be doing the word. Not just hearing it. I enjoy hearing God's word read. I enjoy reading God's word. Many of us do. But living it, it's hard. But living it is what it's all about. Because when we look up again, this word is able to save our very souls. So we go to John chapter 6, we see the feeding of the 5,000 there. And, and as he fed those people, they were, they were very appreciative. They wanted to make him a king. And so he sent a 
apostles across the sea. He goes up into the mountain to pray. And in that instance, he comes and at midnight he's walking across the water and he gets to the other side. The next day, the people wake up and they want some more loaves and fishes. They want more food. And so they look and they say, oh, there's the boat's over there. So they decide to go over where Jesus is. And this is where Jesus is teaching them. That unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no life in you. That's a hard saying. That's a very hard saying. In fact, there are many people who turn away from following after Jesus. So many that Jesus asked the apostles if they're going to leave too. Notice what he tells them in verse 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they're alive. The way he said to eat my body and drink my blood is what he said. Oh, there's some spiritual meaning there. See, what it, you know, there's some real truth in the saying you are what you eat. There's a real truth in that. The food and drink that we ingest gets digested and sent out to all of our cells. So on a very cellular level, the things we fill ourselves up with becomes part of us. As we read and study God's Word, it should become part of us. Because they are a source of life. And I don't mean physical life. I mean Spiritual life. I mean the things that last forever, for eternity, that doesn't have a beginning and doesn't have an end. Notice what it says in verse 23. For if any, the record James 1, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a natural man observing it, or he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. I can look over, and you guys can look at each other. I think some of us here has looked at the mirror. Now, I'm going to give occasion, some of us may not, but I imagine we all looked at the mirror. And we notice that there are things that are out of place. And there are things that are out of place that we spend a lot of time fixing. Now, I don't have to worry about fixing the mirror, but there are other things I've got to worry about. And we spend time doing those things. We make sure everything looks right. That we have, as it's been said growing up, our Sunday best. We are doing what we need to do. But just imagine it's Monday and you wake up and your hair is all outside and you got a little bit of drool and there's some spinach in your teeth. Now you can have to look in the mirror. Some of us will go to work that way, I guarantee you. But that's not going to be everybody. See? When we look into God's Word, there are things that we see here. Or our, we got a little bit of drool, or our hair is all messed up, or there's not only spinach, but there's also broccoli in our teeth. And we look at this Word and we say, Woo! I got work to do. What does James say? Do the work. Whatever it is, change it. Whatever it is, fix it. Whatever it is, engage in it. Whatever it is. But that's hard, but it's worth it. See, when we look at this, it's important for us to understand that as we read and study and apply God's Word, we're going to find out things. And there are going to be different things about us that we're going to have to work on. Every single one of us. I had a, a, a good um, men's word of mine one time. He said when he became a Christian, there were three things he knew he needed to change. He needed to quit cursing, he needed to quit drinking, and he needed to quit smoking. That was it. He said it wasn't long before I found out there was a lot more I had to work on. And we're all like that, aren't we? As, we? as we mature in the faith, there are things that we all have to work on. There are things I'm going to work on. There are things you're going to work on. And I'll help you as 
much as you know me. We need to grow together. And we need something to, to look at. But it all starts in looking in the Word. Allowing it to take root and living that way. Notice that it goes further in verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in, in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but, but a doer of the work, this will only bless in what he does. If anyone amongst you, among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. And the idea of that is we have to exercise self-control. According to what the scripture teaches. What the scripture teaches. It needs to take hold in our mind. And he goes for, uh, further and says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted by the world. The word visit there means to take care of the needs of us. Make sure your orphans are taken care of. They don't anybody take care of them. Make sure widows are taken care of because there are times they struggle. Keep oneself on spot of the world. Don't look the way the world looks. Look the way Jesus looks. Don't look the way society teaches. Look the way that God teaches. See, it's important for us to understand that. It's an error important for us to sit down and think about how this affects our very lives. In fact, I'll put it this way. As you read through Scripture and study God's words, if you cannot see Jesus doing it, we don't need to do that. If we cannot see Jesus behaving in a certain way, we don't need to behave in that way. If we see godly men and godly women in Scripture, and we study their examples and the things they did say and the things they didn't say. And the times they did say things like Peter said things and he was reprimanded. We need to look at those ideas and say, I got it. I got it. I need to do this. But it's not just for today. It's for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Because I'll tell you, there are things today I'm not going to struggle with. I'm not going to struggle reading God's word today because I already have it. You're not going to struggle with that today. Tomorrow may be a different story. I may not find time to study for myself the way I ought. I may not find that tomorrow. Anything can happen tomorrow. You may not find it tomorrow. But the idea is this we've got to be reminded often. That we need to be in the book. And not only are we in the book, we try our dead level best to be human read back. And there are times that we see and we fall short. There are times that we're not who we read about. There are times we're not who we desire to be. Grace is there to cover all those times. And for that, I'm extremely grateful, as I'm sure many of you are. That's the reason Jesus died to give us this hope. It is within us. Today, what are you doing with God's Word? Are you trying your dead level best to live day in and day out? There are times we're not exactly who we want to be, and there are times we're not exactly who we need to be. But we keep on, keep on living. Today, if you're a Christian and you've wandered astray, your life doesn't reflect what God's word says. Life has kind of swallowed you up and you're reacting. Repent, pray, come back. If you're not yet put Christ on the baptism for the forgiveness, the remission, the sin away of your sins, why not do it today? If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're going to tell people that He's the Christ, you're going to change your life in accordance to the fact that Jesus is the Christ. You have your sins washed away in baptism, rise up a new creature, living with Jesus and living with this church family. Or maybe there's another need you need outside salvation. 
Feel free to let it be known. You sing this, your invitation song.